Do you want to lead a profitable advertising strategy rather than micromanage it? Do you want to take the guesswork out of PPC or expand your advertising in other countries and languages? Then you're in the right place. At Databrill, our team of technical marketers and data scientists have poured years of experience into building the most powerful international automation tools for Amazon-sponsored ads. Our tools can handle large accounts with thousands of ad campaigns and millions of keywords across many languages. The total result is increased sales and reduced ACOS. And in contrast to most agencies, our pricing is based on an inexpensive flat rate. So get in touch today. Visit sellersessions.com forward slash agency for more details. Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions. This time we bring in Jared Ha. I hope I pronounced that right. Hello, Jared. Hey, Danny, how are you doing? Thanks for yeah. having me on. I appreciate it. Not a problem. Okay, so today, guys, part of our series of product design, we're taking a, a slightly different perspective now. We'll, we're speaking today about the, um, the factory side of things more so than the entrepreneurial side of things. Do you want to just go into detail and explain what you do and how you work with various entrepreneurs? Yeah, sure. So uh, first, about, a little about us. Uh, my company, we're called ePower Corp. We're a contract manufacturing company and we specialize in customized products. So um, the big difference between customized product and sourcing a common part is that uh, customized products it usually takes place when uh, there's a new product that has been invented for a specific target audience. And with this, usually we have to open up molds and we have to do a lot of product design, which we'll talk more about. And it differs from sourcing because sourcing, you go after a, a factory that already has a mold open. Yeah. So for us, we, uh, we, we focus more on the customized products as well. Cool. So from all the conversations I've had, um, this isn't an area that I'm highly experienced. So hopefully I can answer, ask the questions that the audience wants to hear. So from my understanding, you, you know, uh, the, a lot of the guys that I speak to, they've, they're idea people. So what they'll do is they'll em embark on their journey by sketching out on paper first, maybe, then reaching out to a product designer who, 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 who puts it together in CAD, understands the difference between the materials tolerance and stuff like that. Then the next step of that w would be is they uh, would get a prototype of some form whether that's through sheet metal fabrication or 3D design, whatever format they want to output to that works with the product. And then um, there's that stage of opening a mold or starting a new mold, whatever terminology you want to use. And then there's a step to get into market. So that's the common theme we've been having with the guys on the show. What's the common theme for you? So when someone approaches you, at what stage are they at? Usually, um, I've been uh, talked to at the very early stages. They just have a rendering. They don't have. They've never talked to a product designer. Uh, that's a little bit early for us. Usually, we get started right when the product designer gets in involved, or if they already have a sample. So let's say if they already have an industrial designer, and we work, um, we work with quite a few. Yeah. And it's great to work with them because you know you can bounce ideas off each other. We are the factory, so we have you know we're we are very educated with the material, with the tolerances, um, things like that, the lead time, even making samples. So if it's a new product, we like to be involved as early as possible yeah. because then we have a great understanding of the product. We know what the customer's vision is. Yes. So for our viewpoints, we know exactly what we have to do. Okay. So the idea of these, um, this, this part of the series on the show is to encourage Amazon sellers that are currently rebadging products. Like you said, they go to a, a factory with an open mold already. Now, this can be how long is a piece of string in terms of cost, can't it? You can start, you know, you can put something relatively um, uh, affordable out there that's close to what your private labeling is, or you can spend an absolute fortune and buy a Richard Branson's Island. Where, where would you say in the middle somewhere, you, you're, say you're starting out and you go, right, I want to design products, but I don't have the experience yet. They understand that they're going to want to need to come up with a concept, know that uh, it's patent free or what they're trying to attempt, right? Mm -hmm. And then they're going to reach out to someone to do, you know, they might jump on Fiverr. I'm not saying that's the right place, uh, you know, but they might get some sketch up work done, et cetera. 
if you are an, a seller who wants to dip their toe in the water, what is the most cost effective way to do this? Would it be a single form item that's very small? What would you say here is the best steps for them? The best step I, I would, for me personally to recommend would be to uh, see, a see a market that you're interested in. If this is a market that you're already selling in, then that's great. Then you want to look at a product and then you want to make a minor tweak to that product. So then yeah. that would, that's going to, you know, your costs are going to be very limited then. Yeah. Because then you just have an open mold and then you want to add a certain feature or mm -hmm. a certain accessory to that. That yeah. would be the probably most cost effective way. Yeah, of course. I mean, and that's what people are doing now. I still call it the badging up phase where you've not developed your own product yet because you haven't started a mold. But um, so a lot of people are doing that. So it's just additional configurations. But if you were to start a new mold, where, what would you start with and what would you kind of avoid? Because obviously people can embark on the journey, but ideally they're going to need to go right. I'm normally spending 10 to 15 K say on a private label product. Now, mm -hmm. what about if I want to uh, bring my own one to market, can I get away with spending additional five K or so because I've chosen the right type of product to start as my first product, if that makes sense. That's that, that uh, 5k would be no problem. Uh, yeah. You know, of course that depends on the material. Plastic is usually going to be the most expensive plastic silicon. If you get down it with uh, metals, usually the, the molding cost is cheaper electronics. Of course that is cheaper as well. Yeah. Uh, so if you choose uh, plastics, yeah, of course, uh, five thousand dollars. That's uh, that's not going to be you know a huge investment. No. Uh, um, so yeah, you could open some for that. That's no problem. Yeah, because what we're trying to get to is that encouragement level of people uh, doing the badging, then moving into their own products, getting their feet wet, and then they can get more experience, and they can then have they can make more products with more moving parts per se. Correct. Um, so what you call badging, I'm, I'm working with some companies right now, they're yeah. doing exactly that. They just, there's a, uh, there's a part, I just buy it from the factory and then they just make one little tweak. We have to make a mold just for that little tweak and yeah. then it's very cost effective. It's less than a thousand dollars. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. And you mentioned uh, the Kickstarter. Obviously, the, the Kickstarter takes a little bit of weight off, doesn't it, if you get some funds coming in from contributions that way. So it's easier to get your product to market in a more cost-effective way. Do you, um, what, what kind of, can you name any of the Kickstarters that you've, you've worked on? Um, Correct. Give, give yeah, so um, ePower, we've worked on Peak Design. They're one of the most successful uh, Kickstarters ever. Yeah. Uh, another very successful one would be Anti Labs. They did the Fidget Cube. Yeah. Uh, so for both those companies, for Peak Design, we are still with them. We've been with them since day one. Uh, we do all of their uh, manufacturing. We help them develop their products as well. As yeah. for uh, Anti Labs, we were with them for uh, six months for just developments and then launched into production. I believe we purchased around maybe 20 molds for them, all in all. Yeah. So. Um, that one, that was another one that scaled up. We work with uh, many others as well, kind of more smaller scale. Uh, for for us, I'll always do research just to see kind of who the Kickstarter are. Uh, do they have do they have uh, um, any other products in the markets? And yeah. is their product going to be good enough not to get into um, big bars and sell successfully on Amazon as well? Yeah. So how do you deal with the patent stage? Because we know that, you know, when, when you look up patents, nearly anything can be, uh, have a patent on it, can't it? And it can be kind of frustrating. So how do you deal with the patent process at the very beginning? You come up with a concept, an idea, you've got your industrial designer. Before you want to get into that whole situation with molds and stuff, what are, what are some of the best tips you can give, give to getting around, one, to researching the patents and know that they're going to stand up? Because... Not everyone's going to defend them, right? Uh, but then that becomes a risk. What is your, what uh, was your best tip? I, I work with one industrial designer a good amount. His company's called Tarbo Design, and he does uh, patents for uh, basically nothing. So before, mm -hmm. always before he goes into uh, a project, he always researches it just to make sure there's not a patent. If there's not a patent, 
and he yeah. has the capabilities of writing a patent. This is probably the best advice that I could give is to find an industrial designer that just doesn't understand engineering, manufacturing, but also understands patents. Commercial. So that, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the last thing you want is to just, you know, spend you know, tens of thousands of dollars with design and then find out that you can't use it because of patent issues. Yeah. So okay. always, always research the patent first. Cool. And what do you do? Let's say, for instance, you're keen on an idea and it's debatable. There's a middle ground, isn't it? Is it, is it changed enough to get around the patent and stuff or patent? It depends on what country you're from. Sorry, I'm from yeah. England, so I say uh, <laughs> patent. Um, yeah. So what, what would you suggest here is that you're in that middle ground. How do you cir- not circumvent the system? Because that's not the attempt here, but you know, there's a difference between having uh, patent trolls and mm. patents that stand up, and then there's that innovation by developing new products in between. So there's a fine line between all of those. Mm. But how do you, how would you deal with that situation where it's not clean cut with a with a patent? What how do you usually, work around that and stuff? Usually, uh, you have to know exactly what the patent says. Once you know the patent says, then usually you have to design around that patent. I will never suggest to uh, go into competition with a company that already has a patent because that's always going to end poorly for you. Yeah. Uh, so there are there are easily ways that you could you know work around. You could uh, change parts. You could change functions a little just to work around the uh, just to work around the patents. And that would be okay. Okay, so for, for clarity for the audience, because it sounds like on one side is that if they've got a patent, you shouldn't go after it, but on the other side, there's a workaround. So are we right. saying that, that don't worry if something's got a patent as long as you've got something that uh, is different enough to, that it becomes unquestionable? Is that what you're saying? As long, yeah, correct. As long as it's uh, different, then it's okay. Then you'll file the patent to get patent pending will probably take a few weeks and then to actually receive the patent will probably take about another 11 months. Right. Okay. Now this depends on probably which country you're in. I'm talking strictly about the American markets. I'm not sure how it is in England. Of course. Or yeah. Elsewhere. Well, that brings on another question. Let's just say you're an Amazon seller. You sell worldwide. You're launching your product into the U S to test the waters first. And then you want to roll it out. How does it work with the patent system that way? Uh, for that, you have to make sure, uh, since you're selling it to America, you have to research the patents in America. Yeah. And if you do not research the patents in America and you get yourself into rough, rough waters, then you will be sued out. Yeah. So, so ultimately, if, you, if you're planning on, um, on developing a product, it's, it, it pays dividends to look at all the different marketplaces because quite often, you know, they, there's a lot of sellers out there that may stay in the U.S. and build SKUs there, Right. And then they don't come off the platform and that's their focus. Then you've got other guys who go, well, I'll launch in the US, then I'll go into the UK and then I'll go into the foreign speaking company, uh, countries or vice mm-hmm. versa. So are you saying here is that when you get this, uh, the patents done in your design, it, it's going to be more fruitful for you to say, okay, when launching into the US, we've got to make sure it works in that market. But UK might be slightly different because there might be somewhere where there's a crossover in the design. Exactly. So then it would probably be beneficial to contact uh, some sort of consultant in the UK if you're currently selling it in America. Right. So the idea would be is that you, if you are planning to go worldwide with it, do the work up front and check out the marketplaces you intend to sell on. Because, you know, although European markets are great, normally the, your biggest out the bunch is Germany outside of mm-hmm. the UK. So you might say, well, I won't go to uh, sleepy Spain or worry too much about Italy, okay. but as long as I'm covered uh, predominantly for, say, the US market, the UK and Germany, that would be my focus before I move forward with a mold of any kind, yeah? Correct, yes. Yeah, so the one thing that I could stress is always do your due diligence. Yeah. If you don't do your research, then you'll be, uh, you'll be in some hot water. And so in terms of cost, you know, rough guidance, you know, if you've got someone that, uh, you know, who can work as a consultant, what, what are you looking at roughly? Is it a few hundred dollars to get someone to check all these markets, places, come back with a report to you? or? Usually, uh, if it goes to an industrial designer, you're probably looking at about $1,000, but that will also, he will also write up your patent as well. So okay. he'll write it up and then he'll also apply for it. 
Right, so that's check in, write now, apply for it. And, and that would include a uh, basic level um, workup of the design as well? Correct, exactly. So he'll draw it all up for you for that Correct. cost. So, so what you're saying is the best route to go is instead of just picking an industrial designer from somewhere, make sure they cover the commercial aspects and that they exactly. have the ability to put, apply the patent. So they're giving you a full package. So you're only right. going to one place instead of two to three destinations right. to put this project together, yeah? Yes, correct. All right, so let's walk through the steps. If someone's dealing with you, they come to you, they've done, they've done the uh, industrial design stage, they've reached out to someone, the, the next step is they've, they're going to cover the issues with any patents, then they're going to work up the design with the industrial designer, and it's at that stage that they will come to you, yeah? Usually, yeah. You, or sometimes if they have an idea, they also come to us, and then we refer them to some of our of partners that are um, industrial engineers as well. Okay, so let's talk on a much more on a technical level um, for the audience in terms of the mold. You know, because everyone sees it like quite often a big price tag and there's, you know, people say that, you know, put your, your logo within the mold to protect yourself so the factory can't, you know, do represses or any further manufacturing behind your back, etc. cetera. I've, um, I've had someone on the show who's actually turned up at um, events and seen their product uh, on display to, to say for remanufacturing and it's all been signed off under an NDA. And so China... I've heard heard those two yeah. yeah so china can be quite a difficult place there i mean even the likes of apple and uh, uh the bigger larger brands nike and stuff they mm -hmm. they still have fakes they have to deal with and they've got some of the best lawyers in the world so let's walk through the mold process talk to me on a technical level um what's involved and you know what are molds and etc so okay so mold is basically that's the uh, every usually most pro uh, production lines they they all need a mold whether it's uh, metals plastics uh, electronics everything needs a mold just to ensure the uh, reliability of the products. Yeah. So now there are different grades of molds, and now some factories they might use a lower grade of mold which will decrease the cost, but then in turn you're going to get poorer quality, and then after let's say maybe a hundred thousand cycles, that mold is going to turn pretty bad and it's not going to be as reliable yeah so you want to make sure that you're working with grade a uh steel and usually for us personally we purchase our molds usually from uh japan mm -hmm. uh, sorry uh, we purchase our raw material from japan just because that's the highest grade right and then uh from there we also uh with our production facility we also have our own tooling workshop as well so we have our own engineers on the floor at all times on yeah. there just to make sure that everything is, um, you know, it's flowing the way that it should be. Yeah. And uh, for our engineers, before we get to the stage, they are able to look into the 3D drawings and they are able to pick out certain certain features of the mold just to make sure that it works perfectly. Because let's say if you're getting into a silicon mold, you don't really want any pointy tips because mm -hmm. it's going to it's going to turn. Uh, it's not going to be. You're going to have some quality issues. Yes. So there's a lot of things that this that, uh, you know, normally a manufacturer, they're going to kind of look a blind eye and say, hey, this is a design. So we're going to do it. But um, you uh, for for your clients, for your students, I recommend that they, you know, they they get in contact with a factory that kind of they have their own voice. They're not scared to shout out if something is wrong. Yeah. So and, what you're uh, basically saying there is that um, when when the factory takes on. The, the details for the mold, for instance, mm. you, you're basically saying, look, well, this is what you provided. This is what you're going to get. So what you're saying is you're going, ha ha, there's a, there's an issue here. We need to exactly. review this and then refer this back to the client because the last thing you want to do is spend, you know, run a thousand off, etc. So talk about mm. the mold. You, you mentioned stainless steel. You're buying from Japan to get the highest grade materials and stuff. Correct. Yeah. So that's a uh, carbon steel that we usually buy from them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and so what else is in, involved in terms of negotiation here with the factories? How, how does that work for, for you guys to, you know, protection of the mold, the life cycle of the mold, what to do in terms of structured payments and stuff? Because I've heard in some cases where people say, well, we can open you a new mold. It's going to cost 
X amount of money that can be paid off over this amount of cycles or the money's up front. I've even heard stories where people come in with the mold and then take it away and it gets put in a box somewhere. Do you want to go through some of that for me? Yeah, so actually, uh, for us, we actually have our own production lines. Uh, one of them is plastics, and we also have tooling. So yes. for us, everything stays in-house. So we don't, we don't really worry about anyone coming in and stealing molds. We don't worry about being ripped off. We're never going to sell a mold to someone else. You know, we, yeah, uh, we don't, of course, we don't work that way. Yeah. Um, but so, um, so for, uh, usually for us, what we do is um, – if someone purchases the molds, oh, before that, we, we could offer different payment terms. Uh, yeah. If they want the investment up front, they could, by all means, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, usually it's uh, 50% deposit, then 50% after the mold is done and after we have sent them samples of how the product looks with, yeah. uh, with using the mold. Yeah. And then, uh, also, other ones that we could do, um, if the if the client does have some financial restrictions, then we could build that. We could build the price of the mold into the per unit costs. Yes. And then depending on how the client would like to work or how ambitious they are with sales, we could say, okay, this could be for 10,000, you know, so at this price could be for 10,000 units or if they believe it's too high, then we can push it back to 50,000 units, which will have a, which will have a lower per unit costs. Yeah. So we're very flexible with, uh, you know, working with our client because, you know, especially, you know, if they are, they have some financial restrictions and we, yeah. we should be the one to, you know, work with them and to offer, offer a hand of help. Yeah. Sorry. What, what I was, I, I wasn't uh, implying there that you would ever rip anyone off. I was just trying to oh, no, 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 of course, the audience to understand that situation with the mold, like you said, cause you're set up differently from other factories. And oh. if you're coming into this world, cold there's a lot of technicalities that um you won't know and, and it's important to be aware of and like you said you've you like open book the, the way that you work and the flexibility so what what happens with the molds in terms of let's just say you've done a production run and there's there's still some errors it's not quite right how can you change the trajectory here and 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 make amendments to the mold and stuff or is we, it fixed? yes uh yes we can that's fine so usually after you make a mold, you test it, and sometimes there are some some little uh, some little errors with it. That's why we don't rush into a mass production right away because then instead of having 50 units that are wrong, you're going to have a few hundred or a few thousand units that are wrong. So that's just that's just not a waste of time. That's a um, it's also a huge waste of money. Yeah. Um. So for us, we usually do have a short kind of like a pilot run where we kind of we just test the molds just to make sure everything's okay. We will send the samples to the clients so they can verify it. And then after that, if, if everything is agreed upon, then we will go into mass production. Yeah, of course. All right, so before we wrap, let's just take it from the top. Let's walk through every step just briefly. So um, walk me through the standard steps that you see your guys are doing from the, the idea right up to execution. Yeah, so uh, of course, the, the first stage is always, you know, the idea kind of like the Eureka moments, and then usually you go to a uh, industrial design or some sort of uh, product designer, and then you could either first design the product or you could engineer the product. If there's going to be some technical, um, technical or mechanical features, then you always have to engineer it just to make sure that it works properly. You'll probably have to get some prototypes done made of a functional product, and then from there you could design around the functional feature, you know, make it all look good and everything. And then from there, you go into prototypes again. Um, then you, you uh, go into verification. If the product is good, then you move on. If it's, if, but usually, you know, always with the first one, you usually have to go back, re-engineer it. You have to redesign it or make some small little changes. And then once everything is all okay, you go into the product, develop, uh, you go into the product document stage. Here, we'll uh, usually get everything ready for the tooling. And then simultaneously, we could get the quality reports, the SOP, the, uh, that's the uh, standard operating procedures, and all of the specifics, pants, tone colors, that. Then once that is in, we'll start to open up the tooling. While we're opening up tooling, if it's a rushed order, we could uh, simultaneously buy the raw materials, the resins, anything that we have to buy, the packaging material. And then we'll start 
uh, then we could start mass production. Usually for tooling, it takes about 30 days. Verification, probably about five, 10 days, two weeks maybe if, uh, if we have to send the product to the clients. Yeah. So you're from, from, uh, from the Eureka moment to the end, it depends on uh, the product that you are developing. If it's a relatively simple product, you know, you're buying an existing mold, um, you just have to make some tweaks, then usually maybe about four months yeah. until uh, you could receive the product on your doorstep. Cool. And the one thing, this slot in the uh, Kickstarter from your perspective as well, what's the best tips there? Because obviously that can help raise some funds. Um, so where would you uh, embark on that, the Kickstarter stage within this whole process? For the Kickstarter, it usually has to be from day one because your uh, Kickstarter, you, uh, you have to promise goods by a certain date. Yeah. Uh, I forget the exact that, but I believe it's 75% of the uh, Kickstarters ship out late that are successful. Yeah. So, you know, that's just because usually they don't do their due diligence or they start working with a manufacturer and there's some, there's some misunderstandings or, of course, you know, you hear these horror stories about dealing with some Chinese manufacturers that all they need is a sample, then they could do everything. Then a few months later, they're still developing it with, you know, with nothing to show. So yeah. usually you have to, be, you know, I would always recommend talk to not just one, but a few companies, a few manufacturers, a few agents, if you want to, just to make sure that, you know, everything is, you know, that, and then you could choose the best one from there. Once you choose the best one from there, you could kind of do some development. Then at that time, once you're comfortable with a, once you're comfortable with a prototype that you receive from the manufacturer, then you could probably launch your Kickstarter. Sounds great. Cool. Well, let's wrap that there. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? Um, I would say you could visit our website. It is my uh, company's called epowercorp.com. Uh, e p o w e r c o r p dot com. And uh, if you want to reach me, uh, it could be hello at epowercorp.com or Jared. That is J A R E D at e p o w e r c o r p dot com excellent thanks again for joining us it's been a great episode guys thank you for joining us we look forward to seeing you soon take care